Well, hello, everybody. Um, thank you so much for joining us this morning um, to hear more about the legal revolution and how we're utilizing legal education and practice to transform the criminal legal system. Um, my name is John Geppinger. I'm one of the co-founders of the legal revolution and uh, director at the law firm. Um, and I'll be kind of guiding us through today, um, along with my two esteemed colleagues, Maya Johnson and John Geffen. Um, before we get started, just kind of a couple of housekeeping things. Um, it sounds like there will be two attendance polls uh, throughout this presentation, one um, at five minutes in, and then I think another one around the 45 minute mark. So if you're looking to get um, CLE credits for attendance, just be sure that you um, that you stick around and uh, say yes to those polls. Um, the second piece is that um, we'll have a we'll have some time at the end to answer questions. Um, but if you have questions throughout, please feel free to drop those into the chat, and um, we'll try to get to those um, you know as as needed throughout the conversation. But we'll we'll plan to just kind of work our way through and um, yeah. So um, first, you know, I'd, I'd just like to give you kind of an overview of the legal revolution um, and how we came to be formed. So uh, the legal revolution is a movement to structurally transform the legal discipline. Um, we do this through a series of legal initiatives that center racial equity, wellness, and the expertise of those most impacted by the law. Um, we do this primarily through uh, our prison to law pipeline, which provides legal education for currently incarcerated community members, um, as well as our law firm, which provides civil legal services to currently and formerly incarcerated community members. Um, but this whole endeavor is really built on the assumption that individuals with firsthand knowledge and experience of how the criminal legal system operates and impacts our communities have genius and expertise that can transform um, how the legal system works and how legal services are ultimately provided to the community. Um, and just as we've seen in studies with, uh, within medicine and better health outcomes for patients who receive medical services from practitioners they feel represent them, um, we believe our community members can receive better legal services and better legal outcomes when they feel represented and reflected in their attorneys and judges. Um, so just to kind of show you who we are, uh, this is our team. Um, we've got you know, a, really, a really strong team uh, leading and developing this work, um, but it's really critical to point out that um, our work is focused on and led by those who are directly impacted by the criminal legal system um, and those individuals who have firsthand knowledge of what it means to uh, live in and be impacted by the criminal legal system. Um, to kind of move on to our community partners, um, these, are, these are a few of our main community partners, starting with Youth Lens 360, who um, you know, captures moments through, throughout our um, development uh, from classes to team meetings to um, you know, just kind of some of the, uh, some of, the development um, of our of our organization of this movement and help us in the storytelling piece of that. Um, next is Creative Caponia. Um, they are mental health practitioners and help us guide um, our work with a, with a real focus on mental health um, and good mental health practices. Um, next is Something Great. Um, they ensure that our operations and processes are you know, considerate and sound um, and that we're building a, a good found foundation for this movement in an operations sense. Um, next is Ecotone Analytics. Um, they really help us translate our work into quantifiable dollars and cents so we can give the community, you know, funders, stakeholders, um, a better sense of what our social return on investment is. And finally, we have Until We Are All Free, um, an organization that was founded, um, is led, and is run by uh, previously incarcerated community members. Um, and they really help us uh, on a weekly, sometimes daily basis, guiding us in best practices to really remain community centered and help us build our community engagement so our focus remains true to our mission. 
And of course, um, we wouldn't be able to do this without our institutional partners. Oh, you can see that the first poll um, came up. So if everybody wants to respond to that, um, we wouldn't be able to do this work without our institutional partners. Um, obviously working with um, currently incarcerated folks, um, the Department of Corrections and specifically Commissioner Schnell and the education departments at Shakopee and Stillwater Prison have been key to um, building the prison to law pipeline and ensuring that um, we have adequate access to our scholars, um, as well as, you know, just kind of daily logistics. Um, so uh, our next would be um, Mitchell Hamlin School of Law, where our Juris Doctorate students attend um, school. And then finally, North Hennepin Community College, where our paralegals attend. So moving on. Um, really, today, there are kind of two main goals. Um, the first goal is to really share the two core components of the legal revolution. That is the prison law pipeline and the legal revolution law firm that exists to democratize legal education and to reshape the legal discipline to benefit and comprehensively include incarcerated and formerly incarcerated legal practitioners. The second is to leave you with an understanding of why this work matters um, and hopefully leave you in agreement that um, nobody warrants access to legal education more than someone who has been directly impacted by legal processes and racialized legal outcomes. So to begin, um, I'll pass it over to my colleague, Maya Johnson, who is the director of the Prison Law Pipeline to discuss the magnitude of the pipeline and some of the successes we've had to date. Thanks, John. Hi, everybody. Uh, like John said, my name is Maya. I'm the director of the Prison to Law Pipeline. Um, I want to start off today uh, just by apologizing. I'm a little under the weather, so you might hear that in my voice. Um, but I'm really excited to uh, be able to present to you all today all of the exciting things going on in the pipeline side of Legal Revolution. Um, and share some of the really exciting progress and successes that we've had on behalf of our scholars over the last um, year or so. Um, so the prison to law pipeline is really um, not a new concept. I think this is really something that is important for us to um, make clear as we have these conversations. Um, our scholars are not um, the first legal bastions in their correctional facilities, um, that this legal expertise has existed in correctional facilities for decades prior to our existence as an organization. Our goal as an organization is really to formalize um, that expertise in those facilities and really create pathways for those folks who have that legal expertise, who have taught themselves the law over time as a means of necessity to um, have that knowledge and experience and expertise um, recognized in the field and something that they can use to help others formally. Um, so I like to just start by making that, that really clear off of the bat. And those folks that have existed as legal leaders, as knowledge holders in their facilities amongst their peers are the inspiration for the work that we do. Um, originally, uh, as AllSquare was building out this new legal subsidiary, the Legal Revolution, um, this pipeline was planned as something that was for folks that were formerly incarcerated um, because of all of the what seemed to be very obvious physical barriers to a legal education that being incarcerated comes with. Um, however, over the course of the last few years, as we all know, um, there were many instances that kind of pushed or, or forced our hand in a positive direction into um, looking at this as a possibility for programming inside of correctional facilities. Those instances being COVID, obviously, and distance learning, um, making distance learning a much more conceivable concept, um, and Mitchell ha Hamlin, particularly having students attending law school, um, not only students attending at home, but students attending all across the country from other locations in their hybrid learning program um, made this concept much more conceivable, uh, as well as the murder of George Floyd and uprisings in the Twin Cities in the summer of 2020. Um, 
that is something that we feel created really an appetite for change and for really revolutionary change um, and really opened up the room for conversation such as these um, and about our programming, which we're really, really grateful for uh, coming from such a, a stark tragedy. Um, as well as, like I mentioned before, Mitchell Hanlon's increasing commitment to making legal education accessible um, and their hybrid programming um, that has made them a very clear partner and a committed partner to us in this work, which I'll um, talk about a little bit more in a moment. Um, John, if you want to go to the next slide. Um, so the prison slot pipeline, what, what the heck are we doing? Um, legal Revolution really exists as a um, community conduit in between the scholars who are currently, mo uh, most of which are currently incarcerated and the legal, ed um, in, or the, I'm sorry, the educational institutions that are providing their education. Um, and so with that, we are facilitating what are the first ever ABA approved paralegal programming and ABA accredited law programming or JD programming um, and educational opportunities for folks who are currently incarcerated. Prior to the legal revolution pipeline existing, there were some paralegal education programs that did operate inside of prisons uh, across the country. Those programs, however, were not ABA approved and um, therefore folks were utilizing these programs, investing in education for themselves, hoping that that would create positive opportunity for them once they were released. And then oftentimes because that education wasn't recognized in the legal community or in the legal field, um, it kind of resolved as a dead end for them. Um, and so our program with North Hennepin and our law program with Mitchell Hamlin are the first uh, ABA approved and accredited programs inside facilities. And our law program in particular is the first ever law degree program um, in the country, uh, in the world as we know it, uh, that is existing inside of a correctional facility, which we're very, very proud of. Um, and the whole goal um, I, uh, of the prison law pipeline that I think is so important, especially um, to John and myself, who are both recent law school graduates, uh, is that this is really revolutionizing the classroom. Um, not only are our scholars that enroll in the pipeline who are currently incarcerated and wanting to attain legal education, are they getting um, life-changing legal education that really will open up the realm of possibility and opportunity for them, um, but also the other students in their classroom are getting such a unique experience in having somebody that truly has been impacted by the legal system be in their courses, be able to provide input on, um, you know, a reasonable search and seizure um, from somebody that's lived through it. Um, and that's something that is really beneficial in that it's going both ways um, and, and folks are benefiting from, as opposed to us just sending two law school professors into the prison, um, those two students get their legal education, the professor goes home and everybody goes on with their day to day. Um, we really wanted to bring our scholars into the classroom to really change the conversation in those lecture halls, which has been, um, as somebody who gets to work with not only our scholars, but the students in their classes, um, has been really, really impactful for sure. Um, Johnny, do you wanna go to the next slide? Um, so I'll start by kind of going in depth about our paralegal program a bit. Um, these are our five inaugural paralegal scholars, our, um, current cohort of paralegal students, uh, all five of which are currently incarcerated, um, some at Minnesota Correctional Facility, facility in Shakopee, the state's women's facility, and then also um, the other two at um, MCF Stillwater. Um, the paralegal program, like I mentioned, is in partnership with North Hennepin Community College and their paralegal certificate program. Um, and that means that their educational delivery is primarily asynchronous. Most of their courses are self-paced. They do on a tablet that they have um, on their own, not on their own time, but um, at their own pace um, with some credit requirements being synchronous. So most of their courses are online individual, but then they'll have uh, 
about one class per semester or every other semester that is live over Zoom delivered to them um, where they are interacting in a virtual way with their professor and getting that live um, facilitation of the class. They actually started their cohort back in fall of 2021 uh, a little bit under the radar as we were getting rolling um, and really as our inaugural cohort to learn how this process would work. Um, and with that, they actually are coming up on the end of their programming and um, will be graduating in May of 2023. So they will be our first class that has completed the pipeline, um, which we're very excited about. Um, and both John and John will give you an overview of what that will mean um, when they're done with their educational program in a little bit. Um, but yeah, that's our current cohort. They have really set a solid and strong foundation for the pipeline. Um, we have one student in particular in this paralegal cohort who received the highest score on an exam that his professor had given out in his entire tenure, not just of our PLP scholars, but of all the students he's ever taught. Um, and so we're really, really proud of them um, and really excited for what they are hoping to do with their paralegal education. And then just a quick note and plug, um, we also, uh, in the spring semester of 2023, we'll be starting a new paralegal cohort uh, for folks that are currently on supervised release uh, or more commonly referred to as parole. Um, those, that idea kind of came to us as an exciting progression of our programming. Um, while we wait to host a new cohort inside of the facilities, um, this is something that we are able to do in the meantime on the outside for folks that have experienced incarceration relatively recently and are still interested in pursuing paralegal education in North at North Hennepin. Um, so that will be starting for the very first time come January, which we're very excited about. Uh, all right, and then our two law students um, in partnership with Mitchell Hamlin School of Law. Uh, we have two part-time law students that are enrolled in their day brick and mortar program or just their um, their regular in-person day program um, with the exception that they are part-time as opposed to full-time, which will put them on a four-year schedule as opposed to a three-year graduation schedule. Um, and their programming is delivered entirely synchronously. So a little different than the paralegal in that a lot of their paralegal courses um, like I mentioned, are online and self-paced. Um, our two law students attend class at Mitchell Hamlin live every single day. Um, they will zoom into the lecture hall at Mitchell Hamlin with the room of, you know, 50 or 60 other students um, and are present and interacting in a synchronous way, um, which I say now very casually, um, but when we got it off the ground um, in August when they started classes was actually a very um, challenging hurdle to um, accomplish logistically. Uh, at first they zoomed into class um, just with audio and were able to communicate or answer questions from their professors. Um, with no no camera or visual on um, and after a week or so of pretty hard work and making sure that they had the fullest extent of the experience, they were able to turn their camera on um, and now fully participate in class every single day. Um, they're nearing the end of their very first semester at Mitchell Hamlin um, and approaching finals period. So um, I ask you all to send them some positive thoughts as you probably can remember the angst of your very first finals period as a, a 1L. Um, or, or as a, 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 a law student just really in the thick of it. Um, and so that is where they are at currently. Um, I want to talk just a little bit about the process of how these two law students got there and then also um, kind of give them some individual shout outs quickly before I wrap up for you all. Um, in order for these two students, Maureen and Jeff, to be enrolled at Mitchell Hamlin, they applied to law school just like everyone else in their class. Um, we assisted the Department of Corrections and the Law School Admissions Council in uh, administering a handful of LSAT exams in each correctional facility that we are currently working in. Um, 
at Shakopee, we had three students, three prospective students take the LSAT exam. And in Stillwater, we had a handful of about 14 law students take the LSAT exam at one time. Um, and those folks, we kind of set a, a, a threshold or benchmark score for them to aim for that would be considered competitive for Mitchell Hamlin admission. Um, and we had a handful of those students reach that score um, after several months of self-taught and paced study, which is really impressive as well, considering going through that process while you are in the environment of a correctional facility, um, as opposed to being able to study at home. Um, and then the, of those that got the score, uh, we really worked with each one to develop uh, or identify who would be the most well-rounded applicants based on their prior resume, other programming and leadership opportunities they've been involved in, their demonstrated interest in the law and how they've shown that um, amongst themselves and their peers, um, as well as their LSAT score. Um, and then we submitted both of their applications to Mitchell Hamlin um, and both were admitted, um, which is, is, it was very, very, very exciting. Um, Maureen being the first to get accepted, she was the first ever person incarcerated currently to be accepted into law school in the country. Um, and we're, we're very proud of her for being our first. Um, and Jeff following up shortly thereafter um, and getting admitted just a, a couple of weeks later. Um, they both are in the same section and classes together, started together at the same time. Um, and like I said, are really um, heading into the finish line of their first semester, which we are incredibly proud of. So um, I'm happy to answer any more questions folks have later on um, in the program or as they come up. Um, but thank you for listening and learning about our scholars. I appreciate it. Sweet. Thanks a lot, Maya. Um, so next up, we're going to talk a little bit about the other side of the legal revolution, which is the legal revolution law firm. Um, you know, this was initially created to really solve the question of employment for the pipeline scholars um, and how to really ensure that their expertise and genius um, was being translated into practice. Um, so first and foremost, you know, the, the law firm was created to, um, you know, solve education is great, but at the end of the day, if you don't have a way to apply it, it's just a piece of paper um, hanging on your wall. Um, so we really wanted to make sure that we had meaningful access for our scholars once they were done with their programs to really engage the legal industry. Um, so the firm primarily is tasked with employing our pipeline graduates um, while approaching jurisprudence through the needs and expectations of our community. And I'll get into that, what that means um, a little bit more in depth later on. But um, because there are barriers for individuals with histories of incarceration, um, from attaining legal licensure or um, getting employment within the legal industry, we really uh, set this up so we could have a shortcut um, and short circuit uh, between individuals who are finishing their legal education and how they can really start to practice um, and, eng and engage with clients um, in the field. Um, so, um, you know, we're, we're working to develop ways to employ these folks. Obviously, as Maya said, um, we haven't had any any group graduate yet, but we do have the paralegals, um, our first paralegal cohort that's going to be graduating in the spring. Um, so we're developing kind of these employment pathways for our scholars, regardless of their carceral state and regardless of their licensure state. Um, so, you know, with JDs, we, we realize that licensure is going to be an issue, um, but we really want to start thinking through what other opportunities are available for folks. Um, to meaningfully engage in the law. Um, and so uh, this is this is kind of the, um, I, I see the, you know, the legal education side is really in, focused on the education piece. The, for, the firm is really focused on how to utilize that education and expertise in a thoughtful and transformative way in practice. Um, so in terms of what the law firm will be doing kind of over the next few years um, as we build this arm out, is uh, you know we're we're looking to provide civil legal services for communities that are currently or formerly incarcerated. 
Um, and so with that, we've, we've really devised kind of a three-phased approach of how we can um, remain committed to our mission um, and remain focused on our, our key community, um, but really grow at a manageable pace so we can be useful and um, you know, provide meaningful services to the community at large. So to begin, we've kind of got our phase one, um, which really has our most, um, our tightest kind of universe of clients, but our broadest uh, provision of services. So our, um, our pipeline scholars and um, the fellows at AllSquare, which is our parent company, will kind of be our key universe of clients. Um, but within that, uh, we'll be providing kind of the largest uh, offering of legal services, which my colleague John Geffen will get into in a little bit. Um, but during this phase, you know, we're really focused on how we can provide the best legal services for these two groups of folks. Um, and at the same time, kind of simultaneously starting to identify gaps um, in legal services currently being provided to currently and formerly incarcerated community members. Um, so we'll do this um, kind of through what we, what we see uh, with our interactions with the Pipeline Scholars and the All Square Fellows, um, but also through listening sessions with key community partners, um, which I'll get into later on in the pr presentation. Um, next, we'll have phase two, which will kind of broaden the scope of our universe, um, but start to tailor what our, what our legal services will be. Um, so we'll look back to previous um, cohorts of fellows from the All Square Fellowship. Um, and with that, we'll kind of provide more of a tailored um, listing of civil legal services. Um, but then at the same time, um, we'll be incorporating kind of these pipeline scholars. So we'll be simultaneously um, developing this uh, employment prototype for pipeline scholars. Um, first, it'll be our paralegal cohort. You know, we'll probably get a few of those um, cohorts um, through this employment, this employment prototype before we actually get the JDs. Um, but this will initially uh, allow those pipeline graduates to work within our firm, um, but we'll be really developed with um, an eye on how to get these scholars employed in the private, uh, private firms. Um, the goal is really to get these folks, um, you know, embedded into private firms and get their legal expertise and their genius um, really impacting the legal industry at large. And so um, we'll be developing a, a prototype um, with an eye of how we can then uh, mirror that in private law firms throughout the community. And then um, phase three, finally, will kind of be our broadest scope of clients um, with really our most narrow um, provision of services. And so that, um, that will really be kind of the community at large um, of currently and formerly incarcerated community members. Um, but with a very specific set of services. Um, and those services, again, will be kind of developing um, as, we, as we go through phase one and phase two to identify what is most needed within the community. Um, but then within the, the listening sessions that I'll get into a little bit later on. Um, but next up, I wanna hand it over to John Geffen who can kind of explain a little bit more of what um, civil legal services we're providing now um, and what we'll be looking to provide in the future. Thanks so much, John. Um, hopefully everybody can hear me. My name's John Geffen. I'm an attorney with the Legal Revolution and talking a little bit about the civil legal services that we provide. And this is an evolution. We're new. Um, the goal I think is to grow bigger, to provide more services. But some of the things we do are outlined here. One of the areas we provide services is within sort of the expungement and pardon arena. And our services are, and taking a step back, are going to be against civil legal services. A lot of the people that we encounter and work with have ongoing criminal cases, former criminal cases. But we're, we're focusing on the civil side. And our focus on all of our services is what can we do to help a person uh, move past their interaction with our um, um, criminal court system and support them in living the life that they want to live, pursue the dreams they have, and um, achieve achieve things with their life. 
And we all are familiar with the collateral consequences that individuals experience as a result of a criminal background. In Minnesota, landlords, employers can use arrest records um, to discriminate uh, from hiring people and renting to people. And those are cases, when I say arrest records, I mean cases that weren't charged, cases that were charged but dismissed. So we have a significant issue in our state with the existence of criminal records interfering with people's primarily employment and housing. So we go after these. We go after them um, vigorously to try to remove expungements, obtain pardons, so those records are no longer an impediment to those um, important things, those, those that next level job, uh, that generational change in wealth, uh, dream chasing, which has a lot to do with how we see ourselves and how we present ourselves to others and to allow people full access to all the things they're able to do in their lives. So a lot of expungements, a lot of pardons. We work a fair amount on driver's license reinstatements. We know about the spiral of uh, getting a, a driver's license suspended um, and then driving with a, a suspended driver's license leading to more fines, more problems and this sort of spiral that uh, results in the vast majority of these cases are more cases of poverty than cases of any criminality, but untangling this is difficult and helping people get their license back is huge in Minnesota. It increases the ability of an individual to work where they can work, the hours they can work, and helps them be better parents. We don't have oftentimes great public transportation. The winter is cold. Cars are important in Minnesota. Um, so it's, it's we, we see this as an integral supportive service. Family law wasn't something we had originally thought we'd do, but what we realized was a lot of our clients um, are sometimes estranged from their children and want to be a part of that family relationship and don't know how. And we help them connect. A lot of our clients are non-custodial parents, people who were in prison and are trying to reconnect oftentimes with maybe a, a, another parent that's not real excited about that person reconnecting. But what we know is um, having both parents involved in your life is a good thing, even if one parent made mistakes, even if one parent is not perfect. So connecting families together is a huge issue. And it, it's more than just a nice thing. I mean, it changes everything. It helps people uh, not only the child, but helps that that parent. It's motivation for that parent to do better and gives that parent some rights. Um, we often see, seek what are called parenting plans to ensure that that non-custodial parent can see the kid and are not just up to the whim of the other parent. We, we hear a lot of, oh, I was able to see the child until we, I got in a fight with a custodial parent uh, about... Uh, whatever they fight about, whatever people fight about. But this gives people an opportunity to reconnect with family, stay motivated and um, live a, a, a better life. We'll certainly identify that one of the most important things about this list is this is all written in pencil. It's, it's not in uh, pen, although it's typed here, I guess that's a bad analogy. But, our, but my point is that we have to be fluid. Um, everybody has a different path to you know, dream achieving and, and doing well. And we need to be nimble and figure out what things support them as opposed to just coming up with our list. And so we do other things. We do sometimes orders for protection. We do, uh, we help a lot of businesses start. Sometimes people can't get an expungement and we tell them that, hey, this isn't going to get expunged. What's your other plan? So maybe we help you start a business and get your, your tax ID number. Our goal is to be as um, flexible and fluid as possible, learn new areas of law that we don't know, and use our um, large um, legal partnerships to do areas of law we don't know. We're starting to learn more from our um, clients they have issues with. Um, intellectual property, they want to get a trademark for something. They want to um, do stuff that I don't know how to do, but it's our job to figure out what they need from them. Listen and uh, try to find some remedies to help them within our legal uh, world. And again, civil legal services, um, they're huge. We recently had meetings with our eight 
all square fellows um, who are recent into the program. They're all justice impacted. And of those eight individuals, we had um, conducted intakes with them and we identified 35 separate legal issues. And these are not criminal cases. These are for the most part, civil cases. These services are needed. This is an underserved area in our community. And it's uh, our goal to start remedying that. That's all I got, Johnny. Sounds good. Thanks a lot, John. Um, Thank you. So next up, yeah, just uh, how I kind of want to talk about, we're, we're nearing the end of um, what we want to share with you today, but um, I just want to discuss some of the opportunities and barriers we're working um, with to incorporate the pipeline scholars into the firm. Um, to begin with, um, there's, you know, an experiential learning requirement for both the paralegals as well as the law students. Um, so as we were going through um, kind of the education piece of this, we realized like there's going to be a, a strong need to um, provide some experiential learning opportunities and a way for the students to plug in while they're going through their education to do some real live legal work. Um, and so um, some of the questions, you know, we're working on are what types of cases um, and legal work can we work on with um, students who are currently incarcerated? Um, you know, as, as John just discussed, we've kind of got our current um, list of civil legal services that we're providing, but, um, you know, what aspects of those really lend themselves to, um, to be able to be conducive to, um, you know, communicating with somebody who's currently incarcerated? Um, how can we, how can we engage in meaningful legal work when we have barriers such as, you know, monitored communications with currently incarcerated folks that uh, breaks attorney-client privilege? Um, are there concerns um, of types of legal services? Yeah, are there types of legal services that kind of lend themselves more towards um, document creation or pleading creation um, where the heavy work is more um, creating a typed document as opposed to doing more client-focused or client-centered work. Um, so it's really, you know, thinking outside of the box of what does the whole legal process look like for these different legal services and what aspects can we um, identify that, that might be available for engaging our scholars um, in this work. Um, and then, you know, how does this, how does this, how do these questions evolve and change as we start to think about those on supervised release. Um, as Maya said, like this is kind of a recent um, evolution in our organization um, in terms of like getting to work with folks who are on supervised release. So a lot of the communication issues might go away. Um, you know, there, there won't be so many issues with, um, uh, you know, potential, uh, yeah, I think communications and logistics kind of being the main, main ones, um, but then, what does that mean in terms of uh, just client engagement and being available for the client? Um, so it's um, it's 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 going to be an interesting process, and I think, as John said, we've got to remain nimble um, as we're developing this because um, we don't really know what all the barriers are that we're going to face. Um, but also, you know, what are the options for law students who won't be able to attain their license? Um, for those who are on here who you know, have, have gotten their attorney's license, like we all had to sit for the bar and we all had to go through the character and fitness portion of the bar, which really, you know, exists as a major barrier for folks who are currently incarcerated um, or for folks with, um, you know, histories of incarceration in general. So we're really looking to, you know, think outside of the box of what other ways you can use a JD um, to meaningfully engage in the legal industry, such as lobbying or doing legislative work or legal research. Um, you know, what, what are the different opportunities that we can start to develop and pathways to employment we can develop for our scholars that don't necessarily require licensure. Um, but, you know, regardless, at the end of the day, um, fundamentally, uh, we really believe that the value these individuals can provide the legal industry is without question. Um, and the issue is, for us, the real question is not um, whether they whether they should be engaged in the legal industry, but how we can develop those pathways to meaningfully engage them in the legal industry and provide, you know, substantial on ramps for them to um, get into 
opportunities where they can start to inform and transform the legal industry. Um, so finally, uh, as John mentioned, you know, these legal services have to remain, we have to remain nimble. We've got to really listen to what the community needs and identify what, what gaps exist. And so the, um, the main way that we're really trying to answer that question right now is by engaging in these listening sessions um, as we continue to grow and evolve into the future. Um, the, the listening sessions um, we engage in are really in partnership with Until We Are All Free. Um, Kevin Reese, who's one of the co-founders there, um, you know, he, he leads these listening sessions, um, does all of the um, questioning and kind of leads the conversation that happens with um, community members. And this ensures that it's coming from an informed and considerate lens, um, because I, I, don't, I don't know what a good question is to ask. Um, I don't know how to really plumb the depths of the knowledge of those who have experienced this um, to, to understand really what services aren't being provided and how we can best develop this law firm to fit those needs. Um, so we've really been structuring these listening sessions with impacted individuals at the center to um, try to avoid this ivory tower, this extractive approach that's often utilized um, with impacted communities. Um, you know, we work to make sure that those questions, while compelling and provocative, are coming from a place of experience and empathy. And um, furthermore, we, we pay the folks who engage in these listening sessions. I mean, we firmly believe that um, their expertise and experience is valuable um, and deserves to be compensated. And we don't want to just be going into the community and extracting information that we're then going to use for our benefit without the community feeling like they've gotten some benefit from it as well. Um, so, you know, they're, they're really helping build the revolution into a meaningful engine of change. And we want to make sure that they get compensated adequately for that. Um, so how we're going to use this over the long term, I think, is going to develop um, as we build out the law firm. Um, as we build out kind of, you know, different areas of the legal revolution, but um, we'll be utilizing the learnings that we're taking from these sessions to inform how we provide legal services, what areas the for firm focuses on. Um, but I think more importantly, it's, it's really allowing us to establish meaningful connections with the community um, and, you know, continue to build bridges to the communities that we serve. Um, as opposed to just showing up um, three years down the line and saying, these are the services that we think you need. Um, we really want them to tell us what services they need and how we can best provide them. Um, so that's, that's kind of all we've got for today. Um, but I just want to thank you all for taking time to um, sit with us today and learn more about the legal revolution and how we're looking to transform the legal discipline. And um, we're more than happy to answer any questions you guys might have. And I just want to give an update. We've got about, I don't know, 17 minutes to go of time. Sweet. Thank you, John. And if we don't have questions, that's totally fine. I think we do have to wait two more minutes until the second poll comes out if you want CLE credit. So um, do we have a... We oh, have... Wait, um... Like there's Abby has two questions. Do you want to um, pre present those questions? Yeah, I figure it'll be easier if I just come off of chat um, and, and do this it. <laughs> yeah, um, I work predominantly with young people who are uh, on, currently on probation. So that means most of them are under 18. You mentioned that you have expunge, that you're doing expungements. Is there room for young people who are interested in an expungement of their record to come to your firm and get their record expunged or are you only working on adult expungements um you know i, I think the goal is 100 percent to help the people you work with recently we were just out at red wing um meeting with um the kids and we go over expungement and um i, I think it's an important thing because there's a lot of myths about juvenile records and are they available? Use them. Um, so I, the answer is 100%. We want to be involved with juveniles and expungements. Um, when might be a, a bigger 
question for us because mm -hmm. I think it's it's more of a funding issue. But kids need to know about the expungement laws. It's separate than the adult law, um, and it's actually in a lot of ways better. Um, and uh, you know, with the myths and everybody thinking juvenile records are sealed. Nope. Um, so. Uh, maybe that's something offline we can talk about in the future. It's something we definitely want to be involved in. It's huge. I'd love to chat more about it um, offline. My second question is, um, as you're building out capacity and sort of focusing on expanding operations, sort of, do you have room for young people who are looking for an internship, who have experience being on supervised probation or that sort of thing? Or is that something you would be interested in? I think we would definitely be open to it. Um, yeah, I mean, I think the the whole purpose of this is really to be informed and led by the community. And I think young people with that experience are definitely um, the community that, as John said, we, we hope to serve in the future. Um, so getting them involved um, would, I mean, there's there would be a lot of benefit to that for sure. Um, so if you have if you have people that you're thinking of that you'd like to recommend, yeah, we can definitely talk about that a little bit more offline. For sure. I am always thinking of young people and I've got a couple of folks who are, who are in mine right now. My last thing is also just, hey, Maya, it's nice to see you again. <laughs> Hi, Abby. <laughs> um, that's that's really sweet. Um, there's, uh, there's, there's one quick question in the chat that I wanted to answer please. and then I saw we have a hand up too. Um, so a question that was put in the chat was out of curiosity, how do the law students in the PLP fund law school and do we assist them with their FAFSA? So we do it a little differently uh, between the paralegal pipeline and the JD pipeline. Um, obviously the JD pipeline being a little heftier of a price tag than the paralegal. Um, the tuition for our two law students is completely funded based off grants and philanthropy that we've engaged in. Um, um, I think your second attendance question should have just popped up. Um, so they, we do not complete a FAFSA with our two law students. Um, they are based on their application and their LSAT score awarded individual scholarship packages based on their credentials. Um, and so we accept those and then the remainder of tuition is covered by um, our fundraising and grants that we've been awarded um, because we don't want them to end up in another, uh, you know, challenging situation as having a large amount of student debt amassed against them um, if they don't even have any already prior to their incarceration. Uh, for the paralegal pipeline, because that is um, a little bit a much cheaper of uh, educational cost. Um, we have had donations cover the tuition for our first paralegal cohort. Um, and then also uh, moving forward, those folks will complete a FAFSA just to see if they have any grants applicable toward them, Pell Grants or otherwise, um, if they are eligible and qualify. And then the remainder, again, we would cover based off philanthropy uh, and fundraising. Um, I see that uh, Rebecca has her hand up. Hi, yeah, Rebecca. thanks. Hey, um, real quick. So uh, some of you mentioned the barriers that you anticipate with licensure, which I totally get. Um, have you explored any anticipated barriers with getting professional liability insurance? Um, I ask because we've run into this uh, with our prison doula uh, training program, right? So we have formerly uh, incarcerated clients who have come out and become trained to be doulas in the community and have run into some issues with liability insurance. And I'm wondering if anybody has any recommendations on that. You know, we haven't had any issues, but, but I mean, maybe the big question mark is yet. Um, and so we, you know, I feel like every day we wake up with a new barrier that we have to figure out a way around. And Maya and John have been amazing at navigating those, but it wouldn't surprise me if we have another one to deal with. Um, but at this point, it hasn't. And maybe that's something we could, I mean, it, that's frustrating to me that you're, you're running into that liability, but I, I guess some part of me isn't surprised. Um, 
I don't, and I'll defer to Maya and John on this one. I don't have any great advice on that. From now, I do know. Well, I was going to say there are some bonding things that I I know exist through deed, but on the licensing side, I I don't know, I know the insurance side. Yeah, I know. Just even with our director and officers insurance or DNO insurance, like we got a pretty high rate because of the work that we're doing, um, and the you know, potential liability uh, because of it. So I know we we definitely got hit with a bigger bill than we were anticipating just because of how this work hasn't really been done before. Um, and so I think, you know, there are, there, yeah. we're, we're down to one minute. I just have to chime in. That's what I'm told. Okay. Um, but yeah, we have seen some issues, but would love to connect with you offline and maybe think about some strategies around that if at all possible. Yeah, that sounds great. I'll shoot you an email because I appreciate this. Um, I appreciate your all, your time and expertise today. Thanks. Thank you. Um, you know, Simon put in here, have you ever asked clients to waive privilege with regard to certain transaction work to allow scholars work slash experience while in prison? Are there any workarounds you found? Um, all I can say, I think, is we're working on that right now. Um, like today right now, uh, but that's the goal is to give people some experience and it is challenging. Um, but we're looking at stuff right now. And I think the other question was about the licensure question. So, um, Aline? But we got a, we had an, I think someone was telling us we had one minute to go and we actually had 10. So okay. um, we can go a few more minutes. So we're good if anyone wants to add anything. So, sorry. I saw another raised hand, but it doesn't look like, um, does anybody else have any other questions? If not, um, I would like to just shout out, in addition to the side we had of all of our community partners, um, kind of just plug uh, a lot of the different supportive services that we provide the scholars while they're in school. Um, we really acknowledge that one, going through legal education is a very challenging, mentally rigorous experience. Um, let alone doing it while you're incarcerated. And so in order to make a very holistic supportive service program for our scholars, um, we have worked with various community partners, um, many of which John named at the beginning of our program, um, to provide services to the scholars free of charge to make sure that they are themselves being taken care of and supported outside of just academics and tutoring. Um, and so that includes mental health and wellness supports from Creative Caponia, peer mentorship supports from uh, We Are Until We Are All Free, um, as well as some other uh, peer student or uh, student mentorship from folks that are further along in their legal education, but um, can provide the scholars some insight into what their journey will look like as a law student or a paralegal student, um, as well as some professional mentorship relationships that we've been able to partner with uh, with folks practicing in the community in areas of interest of our scholars to see if it is an area they're interested in, if they um, actually want to work in that field when they're done. Um, so if there are folks who are interested in mentorship, I would just make a little shameless plug uh, to reach out to me. Um, we're always looking to kind of expand the different areas of practice that our scholars can be introduced to. Um, while many of them do want to work in the criminal arena, um, we definitely don't want to pigeonhole them into that by any means. And there are a lot of other areas of practice that they're interested in learning about. So um, I will just leave it with that. I think there's a new question in the chat, so I don't want to take away that time. But um, thanks so much. Feel free to reach Thanks, out. Maya. I, and, and then we do have a new question, and I'll read it, and, and certainly you guys can respond. 
Do you all work with those with lived experience, but who aren't incarcerated or formerly incarcerated, get involved with the legal system and addressing the gaps experienced, or are you open to potential inquiries regarding this? I would say on the pipeline side, not at the moment. Um, I think that is a long-term goal that we're definitely open to. Um, by no means do we want to, you know, limit ourselves and our reach. Um, but because uh, we're kind of learning as we go and the limits in funding and resources, I think we want to be really intentional about rolling out with those that are currently incarcerated and now slowly opening to supervised release. And then I think as we learn, as we go with that cohort, opening up into folks that maybe aren't on parole or supervised release, um, but maybe community probation or supervision um, or are involved um, or impacted in other ways, maybe that we're just not as well versed in. Um, so out from the pipeline side, I would say um, not at this exact moment, but definitely open to inquiries about it for the future. I, I think from from the firm side, we don't differentiate that much between an incarcerated individual, a formerly incarcerated individual, or somebody who's just had an impact by the, the criminal system. Our view of reentry is all of the above. Um, certainly the collateral consequences that flow from interaction with the criminal system is significant for even those who've never been in jail for a day. It, I mean, it's significant for people who've never been convicted. Um, so we take a really broad view on reentry and to include all of those individuals. I think they're different experiences and I think there are some different obstacles, but there's a significant group of people in Minnesota who just were on probation, but, you know, an employer doesn't know how to read, you know, a record to determine whether somebody went to Stillwater or they're on five years probation for a felony, and they oftentimes don't care. So um, we understand that gap, at least on the firm side, and, and want to help bridge it. Um, I don't know if that answers the question, but, you know, does John, my, I don't know if you have anything to add to that. No, that was perfect. All right. Well, thank you, everybody, for coming. Um, thank you. And yeah, follow up with us if you have any other questions. Um, and yeah, we look we look forward to hearing from anybody. And thanks for thanks for giving us your time today. Have a good one.